Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mayfield First uh, United Methodist Church. I'm so glad for everybody who has been able to make it out today. We're trying to figure out if this, the, this is at least the third time, maybe the fourth time, that Sunday has been adversely affected by snow. So the devil is kind of pounding at us. But we're, we're going to stand up. We're going to stand up as best we can, although getting out of the car is just a little tricky. So I'm uh, glad that you're here. Uh, grateful for each person, and if you're visiting with us, we want to extend a special uh, welcome to you today. Still want to invite everybody to use the tear-off section of the bulletin to let us know that you're with us this morning. Um, share any prayer concerns. Sign up for the upcoming Wednesday evening meal. This coming Wednesday is another worship opportunity on Wednesday evening. Instead of our uh, Bible discussion downstairs, we'll have worship and communion here in the sanctuary. And so we invite you to come and be a part of that Wednesday at 6.15. Whether or not you are um, able to be with us for the supper, uh, that will be uh, a wonderful evening to be together. Let's uh, make sure to check on our neighbors and be careful out there. But uh, I'm grateful that you are here this morning. Before we uh, continue with worship, let's give this time to the Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you so much that your spirit is with us. We thank you for the promise Jesus made that he would come to live in us and that your spirit inhabits us. And God, in a really wonderful way also, uh, you come to inhabit the praise of your people as we gather in your sanctuary. And even though we're few in number today, Lord, because of the weather, we know that we can be powerful in spirit because of your presence with us. So we invite that today, Lord, through your word, through the singing, through the praying, through everything that's said and done, may we be drawn closer to you, made more like Jesus. And also, God, we just pray that you would receive all honor and glory because those praises are due only to your name, to the name of Jesus Christ. In his beautiful name we pray together. Amen.
from Luke chapter 4. But before we share, I just have to say happy Valentine's Day. What the greatest, I have a great Valentine in Jesus Christ. And we can all share that. And the scripture that we read today proves his love for us, that he went into the wilderness and was tempted. So if you would, watch for your parts um, as Jesus' words shared with us. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve alone. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm presuming there is probably no children's church this morning. Let's just sing back to back these next two verses of Oh How I Love Jesus. Oh How I Love Jesus.
together maybe in a long time, did something that you might like to sing this morning. How about that? Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing? Number 400. What key is that in, Debbie? E flat? E flat. Thanks, guys.
mighty fortress is our God? We'll find that one. One ten, one hundred and ten. Another great, beautiful hymn, as we do. I will mention that that's a great, I'm so glad you suggested that song, Beth. Um, Claude Stanley, many of you have gotten to know Claude. He called me yesterday afternoon, um, pretty distraught to tell me that his brother Don, who we've been praying for this week, passed away yesterday. But, you know, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. That's where Don is uh, today. He's a very, very uh, grateful believer. And so he is with the Lord today, but we're still uh, being asked to pray for that family. And we will do that. So hope, hopefully you will join me there. Any other concerns that are on your heart today that you might like to name? Bruce Dobbins has been very sick and in the hospital, a first Christian pastor, and he is out of the hospital. And I saw his post on Facebook. He seems to be feeling almost like his old chipper self. He's getting there. Got a ways to go, but, but he's getting there. Grateful for that. How about unspoken concerns this morning? Some? Well, I'd like to 
Tracy's uncle in Texas not doing very well right now. Let's, uh, uh, let's remember him in our prayer. All right, let us uh, pray together. Again, God, we want to be careful today to recognize that you are the source of every blessing. Uh, when we sing that uh, all, all blessings flow from you, Lord, may we know that in the depths of our hearts, that we have not experienced any good gift that hasn't come from you. And we're thankful today, Lord, that you have blessed us in so many ways. And one of those great blessings is the privilege we have of praying together. And so, Father, today we thank you for having the kind of heart that you do, the kind of heart that longs to be in communication with us. And, Father, we also thank you today for your giving heart, your sacrificial heart that held nothing back in order to win us back to you. So, Lord, today we pray that you would be honored in our giving, honored in our praise. Lord, may the name of Jesus receive all honor and power and glory today because he is the only one worthy of that glory, Lord, and his name, the only name worthy. So, Lord, today we pray that that name would receive all, all honor due its name. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. share with you um, the reading from God's Word found in Romans chapter 10. The Word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. 
That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Once again, this is the mighty word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Liz and I are going to sing and play a song for you this morning that some of you have heard a number of times, and we just want you to be assured that if you know the song and would like to sing along, that would be wonderful. It's a, it's a beautiful prayer and praise song called My Lips Will Praise You. Good to know that we belong to God, isn't it? There's a confidence that comes from that that we don't get from any other thing we've accomplished in our life, anything we've secured, 
in our lives, it's not about achievement. It's not about how good we are. It's about knowing in our hearts that we belong to God, that we're God's children. God loves us. God's not interested in forsaking us, and God wasn't interested in forsaking Jesus. That day that the Spirit, the Gospel of Mark says, drove him out into the wilderness. But there was a reason why Jesus needed to go through that particular experience, and we want to discover a little bit about that today. But on this Valentine's Day, a little story to get us started. A guy named David came home from work, and he found this note from his wife tacked onto the refrigerator. It's not working. I can't take it anymore. I've gone to stay at my mother's. David opened the fridge door and saw that the light came on and everything felt cold, so he confusingly muttered to himself, it seems fine to me. I have a theory about that little story. This is probably not the first message that David's wife has given him that he has misunderstood. And if you and I are not careful, we, too, can misunderstand and not get to the deeper meaning that the Lord has for us in his word. He has given us a great blessing by revealing the Bible to humanity. The very word of God is Jesus himself, and the spirit of God lives even through the words of Holy Scripture. What we could easily do today with the story of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness is reduce it to a story about Jesus overcoming temptation by relying on God's word. Now, that's a pretty good lesson. I'm not discounting that lesson, that most typical lesson that we learn from this passage. When you face temptation, if you have God's word hidden in your heart, you will be able to resist that temptation more easily. There's no doubt about it. That's a wonderful lesson, and that is a lesson that this scripture teaches. But I think that the note on our refrigerator this morning is saying to us that there's more being said in this passage. Don't miss it. If you miss it, it will be at your peril. You won't be able to live the full and free, abundant life that God has promised for each one of us. And I gather here with all of you who were brave enough to come out this morning assuming that you want the full, free, abundant life that God promises through Jesus. I want to illustrate by sharing a little story with you. I found it anonymously. I don't know who wrote this, but it sounds just like me and Liz at certain times, right, Liz? Do you remember the story? It was so long ago you heard it told. <laughs> About an hour. The, the writer says, it happened just a couple of weeks ago, but it's happened so many times, it's hard to separate one occasion from another. Chris and I were in a nice restaurant. Most of the meal was behind us. Coffee and the check was in front of us. When the waiter appeared before us and said, kindly allow me to tempt you with a little dessert. You've been to Chow 45, right? It's like <laughs> monster desserts. Well, the desserts, she says, weren't little, and goodness knows they weren't cheap. As for the waiter, he was a nice chap in a nice outfit with a haircut that completely hid his horns. And there was no sign of a red suit or a pitchfork anywhere. As to whether he could tempt us, I didn't know, but after he'd been so nice to us and worked so hard for us, not to listen seemed somehow rude. So we indicated a willingness to listen politely before refusing outright. There was, of course, the carrot cake, which... The waiter described as sinful. Next, he highlighted the creme caramel, which he labeled irresistible, which was followed by the Bavarian tort layered with mousse, which he offered under the heading of obscene. And he concluded with the ever obligatory brown thing known in this particular restaurant as death by chocolate, which he told us was surely to die for. Uncertain as to when we had last updated our wills, we skipped the chocolate, but we did choose one little something, accompanied by two forks, with each of us convinced that we would take one bite and then shove the remainder in the direction of our spouse. Seven dollars and se several seconds later, the dessert was gone. The waiter was gone, and we were gone. 
still wearing a silly grin as if to say, we didn't really need that, but it was good. All of us have our weaknesses, right? We have points of vulnerability where our armor of willpower is both attackable and indefensible. So much so that we joke about tempting places like the dessert table in the shopping mall. And then this author asks the question, is that what the Bible means by temptation? Not really. Well, maybe sort of, although one hates to belittle such a serious subject with such trivial examples. Following any discussion of chocolate cake, if, if you were to say, is this what happened to Jesus in the wilderness? I would want to say, no, you've missed it. Go back to square one, do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not expect a gold star from your Sunday school teacher, and do not tell Alex Trebek that you're ready to try spiritual categories for 1,000. No, this is not what happened to Jesus in the wilderness. In the wilderness, Jesus endured a time of testing, a time of intense personal reflection, and, and friends, if we observe the season of Lent, which Christians have been doing now for almost 1,800 years, the season of Lent is a time when you and I are called to endure the testing, to be ready, as ready as you and I can humanly be with God's help, ready to face our trials, which are certainly monumental. The challenges that sometimes come up against us, that we are ready to go through this time of testing, and also, on purpose, go into a time of intense personal reflection. Intense personal reflection. Well, you might have noticed in the Bible story that some of you have heard probably hundreds of times that it says after 40 days, Jesus was without food, and after 40 days, Jesus was hungry, and then, after 40 days, Jesus gets these three specific temptations. But don't forget that Jesus has already been in the wilderness for 40 days, and God says that Jesus has been tempted by the devil the entire time. These are just the three temptations that the devil issues to Jesus that we know about. But I think we can summarize the three temptations by saying that this is what the devil was saying to Jesus. Don't trust God. Take matters into your own hands. You need food. You are capable of great power, and you are special above all others. The devil says to Jesus, do something about it, son of God. And the devil is still saying to God's people today, don't trust God. Take matters into your own hands. Worry about what you will eat. Worry about what you will wear. Worry about what tomorrow holds, and do something about it sons and daughters of man. So we gather today thankful that Jesus went the way of the cross ahead of us, that Jesus went as the supreme example of how we can also go toward God. The book of Hebrews recalls the temptation of Jesus this way, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in how many ways? every way. He's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Yet was without sin. So Jesus endures these 40 days plus this episode, and, and it's as if God is saying, now you watch Jesus and you understand he has been through whatever it is you are going through, whatever it is you have been through, and whatever it is you may yet go through in your life. But I think this morning that not only is the devil's message that we ought to take matters into our own hands, but also a big part of this message is that you should put yourself first. In other words, if I was going to put words in the devil's mouth that he was saying to Jesus, it would be, Jesus, prioritize yourself. There will be plenty left over for others. And the devil is still saying to God's people, prioritize yourself, and you can still be plenty good enough for others in this dog-eat-dog -dog world if you stake your own claim and set your personal goals and achieve for your own sake what is your heart's desire, seemingly. 
food and drink, power and prestige, security and specialness. Put yourself first, otherwise you are a fool. In this scene from Luke chapter 4, we get to witness a very peculiar power of Jesus. He's able to resist the devil's urgings to take the reins. Even though Jesus, by his own, by all rights, could take the reins if he wanted to, he's able to resist the devil's urgings to do so. Have you ever noticed this? It takes a lot more strength sometimes not to do something than to do something. You ever notice that? Like, for instance, I didn't do this, but if I had given up ice cream for Lent, it would be a lot tougher, and promise you this is true, would be a lot tougher not to eat the ice cream than it would be to just go ahead and eat it. If your issue is anger or fear or resentment or jealousy or pain and one of those emotions gets the best of you, it is a lot more difficult not to lash out than it is to go ahead and let loose with an emotional response. We're all prone to fall victim to our quick emotional responses. There was a guy named Colby who was asked about conflict at home, and Colby explained about his marriage situation. He said, when my wife gets a little upset, sometimes a simple calm down in a soothing voice is all it takes to get her a lot upset. <laughs> Emotional responses are easy to come by. It's harder not to make the emotional response than it is to go ahead and be free with that response. So what is the reason that we can observe that Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness? Who was that experience for? Who was that experience for? And in order to answer that question this morning, I want to go back to chapter 3, and I also want us to remember what is beyond this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 4. In other words, let's see the flow of the story the way that Luke tells it. In Luke chapter 3, verse 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now, I want you to remember the story and the order of its flow this morning, okay? Here's Luke chapter 3. Jesus is being baptized. And the way that Luke tells the story, Jesus comes out of the water, and the Gospel of Mark says is driven by the Spirit of God into the wilderness, into the testing, into the hunger, into the temptation, into the loneliness. This is a good and fair and even holy question. Why does God, why does God, who has just professed his deep love for Jesus at his baptism, want him, <laughs> for crying out loud, to go endure this trial, this body and soul crushing exercise? Why does God want that for the Son he has just declared such profound love for. I mean, have you ever strategized for your children a way to get them into a season of temptation? Have you ever strategized ways to make sure your children or grandchildren could go through a certain trial in their lives? Now, I know you're wise people. You understand that trials produce good fruit, but have you ever actually wanted to encourage that situation to unfold so that your children could experience it. I think it's a good question to ask. Why does God want Jesus to endure this? And another good question, a great follow-up to that question is, why does God allow us to endure such trials? Why does God allow us to face horrors in our lives? Many of you I know very well. I know some of the things that you're going through or things that you have been through in the past, and I don't know what you will be going through, but I, but I know life. I know that we're going to have constant sorrows and heartaches. It's, it's, it, they're, they're ours invariably if we're actually paying attention to the world in which we live. Why does God allow these experiences? And so here we have Jesus being baptized, and then Jesus being led by God's own Spirit into a time of intense uh, 
not persecution of spirit, I guess, would be a, a, a fair way to say what Jesus is enduring. I want to suggest that paying attention to the flow of the whole story is important as we try to answer that question and understand the deepest meaning of this story about the temptation of Jesus. So, he's baptized, right? Chapter 3. Beginning of chapter 4, he's tempted and tested for 40 days. You remember what happens next? He goes home, right? He goes home, he comes up out of the desert. I'm thinking he needs a shower, right? He not only needs something to eat, he needs a little bit of time to recover from all that silence. Probably needs a, a couple of days to hang out with his friends. He's going back home. And he goes back home, and you know what he does at home? He's been baptized. He understands he's called by God. He's claimed by God. He's loved by God. He's tested in the wilderness, and he endures this deep trial. And then he's ready to declare his life's mission, his purpose. And he quotes Isaiah as he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You've heard the expression before, you can't be good for others if you're not good for yourself, right? In fact, I wasn't able to be at Ash Wednesday, but I understand this is one of the points that Hugh made the other night, which I'm grateful for. You can't be good for others until you've made yourself ready. You know, the Bible teaches us, love your neighbor as you love yourself. It presupposes that you love yourself, that you're doing a good job taking care of yourself, that you have done a good job getting yourself ready. See, Jesus, going into the wilderness at the very beginning of his ministry, was a way of putting first things first. His wilderness, his temptation, his early trial prepared him for everything that his future held. And he was not ready for that future until he endured this time of testing and trial. That time, you can look at it as a valley, whatever your experience is, what have you been through that's heartbreaking? What have you been through that has brought you to a point of of sorrow or temptation so great that you thought you might not ever overcome it, that you might not make it through. But here you are today, this morning, in this sanctuary. See, these things that we endure and that we go through, they are, a, if we understand them correctly, they're a way of putting first things first, making sure that we're where we need to be. Because when Jesus had endured this, it did make him ready then to put others first. This season of temptation made Jesus ready to empty himself for the sake of others. See, friends, if we avoid our challenges, if we avoid our obstacles, if, if we're in denial about our need, if we try to escape through the use of substances or through engaging in certain kinds of behaviors or getting into certain kinds of relationships, if we do those things, we're avoiding the wilderness. And it's another way of saying something back to the devil, which would be, yes, I'm with you. I won't trust God. I'll take matters into my own hands. I know in my own life, I could illustrate in painful ways what it's been like for me when I've decided that I'm a pretty good captain of my own ship. <laughs> it, it doesn't, it has not worked out well in the situations in my current life where I have tried to take the reins back. It's not working out well. And I know based on those experiences that for the future, it won't work out well for me in the future. It won't. It won't. And I won't be ready for what God wants me to do in my marriage, with my family, in my job. And, and it's true in your job, too, whether or not you're in some sort of a vocation that has to do with God. It, it doesn't matter. In your job, in your community, in what God has called you to do, you won't be ready unless you're willing to face the obstacle, to face the challenge, to endure whatever the 40 days in the wilderness is for you. It may still be ahead of you. You may be in the middle of it. Some of it you've already experienced. Maybe it's going to come in blocks. Sad to say, 
We've all still got more ahead of us. But are we ready to go through it? How many of you are giving up something for Lent? I'm not, so don't be embarrassed if you're not. It used to be more common that people challenged, the pastors challenged the church to do so. Probably ought to. Liz is taking something on for Lent. Some of us do that too, doing something additional. This is something that Pope Francis said last year during the season of Lent. He suggested that even more than candy or alcohol, we fast from indifference toward others. Isn't that a powerful phrase? Just the thought of it. Fast from indifference toward others. He says, indifference to our neighbor and to God also represents a real temptation for us Christians. Each year during Lent, we need to hear once more the voice of the prophets who cry out and trouble our conscience. Whenever our interior life becomes caught up in its own interests and concerns, there is no longer room for others, no place for the poor. God's voice is no longer heard, the quiet joy of his love is no longer felt, and the desire to do good fades. We end up being incapable of feeling compassion at the outcry of the poor, weeping for other people's pain, and feeling a need to help them, as though all this were someone else's responsibility and not our own. And then he concludes these remarks by saying, but when we fast from this indifference, we can begin to feast on love. You know, if the change that we want to make is a change in our bodies, maybe we do give up ice cream or candy or alcohol or sugary drinks or whatever the case may be. But if you want to change your heart, if you want to allow God to change your heart, a deeper, more difficult fast is needed. It's not the dessert tray at the restaurant that's a great temptation. That's not the trial that you're about to go through. That's not the cross you have to bear, not being able to get that dessert. The cross you have to bear. We don't trivialize the cross of Jesus by reducing it to something so small. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. And so the Lord is calling us today to to move toward that fast from indifference, to take care of first things first, to make sure we're ready for the storm that's ahead, because once we get out there, it's these experiences we've had in our life that are, that are going to help us help that person in the midst of their storm. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's stand and sing together. Big 618 seat dinner theater. Liz was the production stage manager there. 
they had a reputation for very, very good food. And uh, invariably, when the host would come out after the meal had been served, before the production started, he would say, how was your food tonight? Well, it was, a re you know, it was one of those questions that, you know, the audience is going to be polite enough that if somebody did have a bad experience, they were going to be quiet, and everybody was applauding. Woo! -hoo! The food was great. Right? It's sort of a setup. But are you glad you came to church this morning? <laughs> well, <the> church great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, no, no pressure. You didn't have to say yes to that. I am so glad that you came today. You know, uh, getting this message ready this week was very important for me personally. Um, I hope that the message this morning is also something that you will take to heart. And if you um, have a response to the message from this morning that you need to talk about or just want to pray with somebody about, I'd be really, really happy to do that. Uh, to meet with you or just talk with you over the phone or whatever uh, might be helpful. And if it's not me you want to talk to, there are lots of reliable Christian friends that are around. If you don't know any of them, let us hook you up with some people that can be in relationship with you um, so that you know you have somebody you can talk to. Um, I was talking about that with you last week, and I realized that's a void in my own life, you know, just I'm, I really got to have uh, on the worst days somebody I can talk with about those things. Um, so it's not good for me to preach to you about something that I believe is true that I'm not doing, you know, myself. So um, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> Let's pray together. <clears throat> God, you have been good to us, and we know, Lord, that even though you don't cause the, every pain that we feel, every trial that we go through, these Lord, our results of the fallen world in which we live and the devil who works against us and against your plans. But Lord, you do use these wilderness experiences and these trials and these painful things to transform our lives and then to help us be your agents of transformation for others. So Lord, help us to be ready ourselves to be good for others by being willing to endure those things, trusting in your grace not taking matters into our own hands, but, Lord, trusting in you, trusting only God in you. Lord, we thank you so much for the blessing of your Spirit's presence in our hearts, and we invoke the Spirit's presence to continue to be with us, Lord. We know he will uh, throughout this day and this week and throughout our lives. These things we pray in the matchless name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray together when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.